This is Podcast Rally with your hosts Ashton and Hayes. So you had the Great Recession, you had the digital destruction of the industry, and then you had tremendous debt. So they, they, you know, you talk about getting hit from all sides. Welcome into Podcast Raleigh. In this episode, we talk to Orich Quarles, who served as president and publisher for the News and Observer for 16 years and has been on just about every board you can think of, both locally and nationally, including the North Carolina Museum of History, the Dix Park Conservancy, and the UNC School of Media and Journalism Foundation. He's led newspapers all over the country, but beyond his tangible resume, he's just one of those people who, when he speaks, you feel like you should probably be listening. You get to listen to him talk about the importance of media, what newspapers got wrong in the last quarter century, and the importance of Raleigh getting Dick's Park right. Orange Quarles grew an affection for newspapers at a young age with the help of a mentor, but the desire to support himself and his family drew him to the business side of the paper, which led to a successful four-decade career in running local newspapers in different parts of the country. His passion for journalism has continued after his run as president at the News and Observer and led to him helping to found the Journalism Funding Project, which is trying to help fill the void of local journalism that the collapse of newspapers left behind. We touched on a number of topics concerning media and Raleigh's present and future, but we started by asking Orange Quarles how he ended up in Raleigh. I came here to be publisher of the News and Observer on January 1st, 2000. And so, didn't know if we were going to have a paper that day or not, but I was here. Wait, why not? Oh, because not, yeah. Okay. It was the uh, Y2K. Y2K. That's right. I was, I, was, I was flashing through crises of the last 25 years <laughs> to figure out which one it was. I was like, no, it wasn't a pandemic. Y2K. It wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and where did you move from? Northern California, but Modesto, California, which is about 90 miles east of San Francisco. And I imagine you'd, as in, in the industry, been bouncing around a little bit prior to that. Yeah. So I actually had a plan uh, getting to Raleigh. When uh, the News and Observer at that time was owned by the Daniels family, uh, they sold the paper to McClatchy in 1995. And at that time, I was publisher of the McClatchy paper in Rock Hill, South Carolina, overseeing Rock Hill, Hilton Head, and Beaufort. And when uh, the purchase was made, I said to my wife, I said, you know what, it'd be pretty cool someday to go to Raleigh uh, and be the publisher. But I didn't think I could take take the big leap from Rock Hill to Raleigh, and uh, neither did corporate for that matter. <laughs> and uh, in 1996, less than six months later, they asked me to go and be the first publisher of their paper in Modesto. Uh, prior to that, they'd never had a publisher. They, it was a general manager editor system. And so I went there uh, as the first publisher, but in the back of my mind, I always said, well, someday maybe I'll get to Raleigh. So, What was it about Raleigh? Uh, was in, and I was going to ask you in general, how much did you weigh the factors of the job itself versus like the city or the place you wanted to live and what caught your eye about the Raleigh job? So Raleigh I had known about for a number of years. I, I was on the board of the Associated Press along with Frank Daniels, who owned the paper then. And so I knew about Raleigh. Uh, my oldest daughter uh, was at Carolina, so we would come uh, to visit. And the paper had a great reputation. And you all may not recall this, but at the turn of the 21st century, there was an organization asked to name the 21 best newspapers in America at that time, going into the 21st century. And the News and Observer came in at number 16, oh, wow. the smallest paper on the list. So I knew its reputation was well regarded. And uh, it was, a, you know, just a great, great paper that the Daniels family had produced for a long time. So getting the opportunity to come here was like, you know, the icing on the cake for my career. And then you moved to Raleigh. Then I moved and, to Raleigh. And did it live up to your expectations as a city? Uh, the city <laughs> absolutely surpassed my expectations. Downtown, now that's a whole different story. Uh, when when, uh, when I got here downtown, and you all know this, 
Uh, it was a huge disappointment. I was like, wow, this is, this is the capital cities downtown. There was nothing here. Maybe two or three places to dine in the evening. And, and as you know, at 5 o'clock, this place was like a ghost town. So uh, clearly there was opportunity here to, to, you know, see some revitalization of downtown. And I was delighted when uh, Mayor Meeker made that one of his priorities. What got you into the newspaper business originally? So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was actually a senior in high school and uh, on my spring break, and I get a call that Monday morning, and it was the local newspaper, HR department, saying, uh, you're supposed to be here at 4 this afternoon. I said, beware. And they said, here. I said, Doing what? They said, well, you don't know. I said, know what? They said, well, your English teacher has uh, given us your name as our yearly intern for two weeks, and he's been doing that for years, and we would like for you to come in and just work for two weeks during the spring. I said, yeah, but it's my spring break, <laughs> you know? And they said, well, do you want to come in or not? And so I, I thought, well, what the heck? And... Uh, that two-week uh, internship came into a lifetime of a career. That's wonderful. So, and was this a teacher that you had a great fondness for, and so absolutely. you were willing to take the leap? A absolutely. And, and I, I called him. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? He says, well, I didn't know if you'd take it or not. So I figured if they surprised you, you know, you would do it. So, uh, yeah, I started there and uh, really enjoyed all I really was was a, in those days called a devil's helper, you know, and I just went in and cleaned type and looked at type and passed copy on downstairs, ran it upstairs, downstairs, uh, watched the editors scream at each other and pull alcohol out of their drawers and hit a shot, and, you know, I, well, this is a great <laughs> lifestyle here, smoke fill rooms and all kind of action until it was deadline time, and it was a whole different world, yeah, and it was really <laughs> exciting, you know. Really exciting to see something come together every day, something, a new product every day. So it got in my blood, needless to say. Why is it called a devil's helper? Uh, because nobody else wanted to do that work. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> it's a long story. And I, I think I heard on a podcast that you've done before that there was a time where you wanted to be a police officer. Is this yes. the same teacher that sort of changed your mind? No, on that? no, no, it okay. was actually uh, a lieutenant, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, captain who was teaching uh, a uh, criminal justice class. And uh, I really, that was my goal when I went to college was to be a criminal justice major. And he pulled me over one day after class. He said, you know, I, I noticed you asked really good questions and that's really good. He said, but there's just one problem. I said, well, there's a problem. He says, yeah. He said, you know, when you're in the police department, when you're in law enforcement, you're trained to respond, not to ask questions. Now, remember, this was 50-odd years ago. And uh, he said, you stopping to ask questions could probably get somebody hurt. He said, so just, I just want you to think about, you know, how you were approaching things. And, I, and with that advice, I said, well, you know, he's absolutely right. Uh, hmm. Hmm, maybe I'm not fit to be a policeman because I, I didn't go into the military. I didn't know how to take orders. And I was just one of these people, very inquisitive. So I just ask a lot of questions. Well, that's not how it works in the law, law enforcement, you know. So best advice I ever got. So you had the high school internship and that still didn't quite persuade you. And then in college, you decided? I decided that I'm going to switch my major, you know, and uh, for not do law enforcement. And, and I'm glad I did. I became a marketing major. And all that time, I was still working, still working part-time for the paper. And uh, just one thing led to another. And uh, I've had all these great mentors. And maybe we'll talk about mentors uh, a little later. But I've had some good, good people lead me. In fact, I'll, I'll share this. When I got that call April 2nd, 1969, uh, it was from the assistant HR director at the paper. And she and I became best of friends until she died in 19, 
97. Wow. We talked weekly. I mean, wherever I was, uh, and I moved several times, but I always would call Bev because she was a great mentor to me. Yeah, so. All right, so if you were devil's helper at one point in the newspaper, and we know we've, you've gotten to publish here at one point, is it safe to assume you've held almost every job in between? And we don't need to hit everyone, but <laughs> no. was, was there a certain path that you took through newspapers, yeah. or did you do a little you, bit of everything? You know, I mentioned marketing. So I started out uh, in marketing, and in those days, uh, I realized where the money was in the business, and the money was in advertising. So uh, I talked to another mentor of mine, the VP of marketing at, at the paper, and he said, well, if you want to make some money, go to advertising because those folks make more than everybody else in the building. I said, well, okay, well, I'll go over there. And uh, I did do that and had a really, really successful career in sales, advertising, marketing, sales. Uh, I brought a lot of uh, background, uh, if you will, with me when I'm out talking to customers, it was easy to explain to them how everything worked, right? When you're selling advertising, you're really selling yourself. And the more you impress the people that you're talking to, that they believe in you, not so much your product, they believe in you. And they knew that I knew that product inside and out. And so there was a, a trust that allowed me to be very successful in advertising. And then another mentor, uh, Bill Honey said, had had heard about me, and uh, he was publisher at the time. And he brought me upstairs one day. He said, you know, you, you are a diamond in the rough, and I see so much potential in you, and I'm going to try and help you, you know, with those rough edges and, and get you on track to be a publisher. And I said, whoa, you know, because that, that wasn't something that had crossed my mind. I just wanted to make a lot of money, you know. <laughs> Heck, I was doing quite well. But then uh, they put me in, and this is when I worked for Gannett. And at that time, Gannett was the largest and still the largest newspaper company uh, out there. And they were just beginning to understand the value of having a diverse workforce. And so they were putting in programs to train women and people of color to get them in the pipeline into management. And so timing was everything for me. And, uh, you know, I took advantage of those opportunities. They gave me uh, special management training, uh, two-week periods all over the country uh, with senior leaders in the organization. And, you know, when you get those opportunities, it's up to you what you do with them. And, and I had made a promise to myself that if given the opportunity, I was going to be the best that I could be and let the chips fall. And then once I started, you know, meeting other folks and I realized, well, you know, I've just got as much talent as the next person. So then I start setting goals. And I've always believed in setting goals. And one of my first goals at that point was, you know what, I want to be a publisher by the time I'm 35. And at that time I was 32. So I figured, you know, in three years, I want to be a publisher. And uh, I was six months I missed the, missed the 35 by six months, but I did become a publisher at 36. Uh, again, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities. Uh, and our, our first publishing position was in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I, I never knew about Fort Collins. I get a phone call, and uh, my boss uh, said to me, uh, well, you're going to be a publisher in Fort Collins. I said, great. Well, where's Fort Collins? He said, well, it's in Colorado. I went, oh, okay, wonderful, yeah. So I read, you know, I'm reading all the data and demographics about Colorado. And for some reason, maybe that it was back then I really realized I needed glasses. I thought it said the African-American population was 10%. And so I told my wife, I said, you know, 10%, you know, we'll be fine, you know. And when we got to Fort Collins, we were there two weeks. And I never saw a person of color. I said, well, what the hell? You know, and I went back and looked at the data again, and it said 1%. 1%. I went, oh, my God, you know, whoa. So, <laughs> so it took us, I don't know, a month before we saw anyone of color. Wow. But we, we loved Colorado. The kids loved it. You know, the, it's snowing. And uh, if you've ever lived in Colorado, you know the weather changes every 10 minutes. 
And, and we had a wonderful time. We wrecked a few cars and all that jazz, <laughs> but we learned how to ski. And uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful lifestyle, wonderful community. The quality of life was very, very high. And it was uh, a school dominated by Colorado State. It was the largest employer. And during the summer, there were only 60,000 people there. And when school was back in, there were 90,000 people. So, yeah, we had a wonderful time there. But after three winters, That's I was enough. ready to go. Yeah. You know. Wow. Uh, I was just going to say, so you had this goal of being a publisher, mm -hmm. and you mentioned previously that another paper had a GM editor model. What does a publisher at a newspaper do? Yeah. The best way, there's two ways to describe a publisher. One, uh, I used to say it's like uh, being the uh, head of the orchestra. Okay. Right? You're the conductor. You don't play an instrument. You just lead everybody, hopefully, into playing great music. That's one way to look at uh, the position. And the other way to look at it is you're really the president of the organization, right? So my title was president and publisher, uh, which meant that I was responsible for every aspect of the business. Uh, you, you always wanted to make sure you had a great team, you had a great editor, uh, because the the better the news product, the better your paper is going to be. It's better for everyone all the way around. And I was blessed to have some really, really wonderful editors in my career. So, uh, and I'm just getting into the nuts and bolts. I promise you when I first, I always tell people, uh, the first time I ever wrote a newspaper story, I was writing preps. And I truly believed that if I didn't get to the paper and write my story that night, the next day, the paper would go out with a, a white square where my story was supposed to be, or they might even put Hayes Permar didn't turn in his story. <laughs> like that's how naive I was, and I was, and 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 they had told me they were going to pay me to work. I, the uh, the same way, for longer than I should have thought. I truly meant pub like you publish a paper every day, right? I thought the publisher was like the head of printing. Like the guy that's in charge of making sure, like, first of all, talk to the publisher if it's not like yeah. printing. But, but, so give me a little more nuts and bolts on the on newspaper structure generally. So, publisher is like the president, right? Editor is over everything. Editor is over all, the newsroom. All the content. Okay, all the con not all of the content. It it really depends on on the model. Uh, for most of my career, uh, my editors were only over the news content. And I had an editorial page editor sure. responsible for that aspect so that the two were always separate. Uh, the editor never knew what the editorial was going to be. Mm. You know, every once in a while when we thought it was going to uh, fire up some people or cause some controversy, we would give the editor a head, heads up. But, oh, by the way, here's what's going on. But there was always we always tried to separate the two. And then who's your other, who else so is then, on that level? Business manager? So you, you, had, you had a VP of finance. Typically, you had a VP of uh, production, advertising, HR, uh, marketing, and, of course, circulation audience. So that was kind of the direct reports. And uh, during my career, I also had, uh, for a while, we had a uh, public editor here in Raleigh, which uh, we started because we wanted to get more input from the public on what they were feeling and thinking about our content. And, and that was a good, good position to have. So yeah, so uh, those seven or eight people. And then uh, here in Raleigh, I also had those community papers that I mentioned earlier in Cary and Chapel Hill and Durham uh, Smithville, and they all had their own publishers who reported to me. So at one time, I probably had, I don't know, 15 direct reports. That's too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all really excellent people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What makes a good publisher? Uh, a good publisher is like any really good uh, CEO, sure. and that is being a good listener. Okay. Uh, it, it took me a while to really understand that being a great communicator really helps, right? Being empathetic 
really helps. But really, if you really want to be effective, be a really good listener. You know, make sure the person that you're talking to, they truly believe that you're listening to them, that you're connecting to them. And it took me a while to really understand the importance of that. But I think I got there. You know, I, I'm certainly like any of us. Uh, I was a hotshot young publisher and thought I knew everything. And uh, boy, <laughs> again, Beverly kept me grounded because I would call her and she'd go, did you think about that? <laughs> did you think about this? And i go, oh, no, Beverly, I didn't. So again, having those mentors and being able to bounce things off of people uh, that don't do what you do, but could see the world different because of what they do, it was really helpful to me. And I, you know, needless to say, I try to pay it for it. And you were at the News and Observer for 16 years, correct? 16 and a half, yeah. And that was a pretty, I don't want to say tumultuous or turbulent, but there were a lot of transition in the industry <laughs> in that time. I mean, what were some of the biggest challenges you got to face and maybe even some of the kind of exciting things you got to do? So uh, thank you for the question, Ashton. When, when I got here in 2000, from 2000 to about 2007 were really just boom times for the NNO. And, you know, I thought I was the smartest guy in the world. Like, wow, you know, God, you're really smart. You picked a, you picked a great paper to go to, <laughs> a great market. And then, of course, it all came crashing down like so many things in 2008. And um, we knew that... You know, we had been through recessions, right? I mean, I've been in the business long enough, uh, and you know that they last 18 months to two years. But what we did not know was how deep the uh, digital disruption was going to be. We just, we had talked about it for years and years. We thought we had prepared for it. We just weren't. And uh, then you add on the fact that McClatchy, Timings, everything in life, in 2008, acquired Knight Ritter newspapers. So you had the Great Recession. You had the digital destruction of the industry. And then you had tremendous debt that McClatchy had acquired buying uh, Knight Ritter. So they, they, you know, you talk about getting hit from all sides. We weren't prepared for that. We just weren't. And you know, the first year we went through layoffs, which we had, you know, over my time as publisher, I'd only had a couple of minor layoffs, nothing really serious like this. But then after the third round, you started saying, oh, man, this is this is a lot worse than any of us could have imagined. Uh, and your question was, what could we have done differently? I think I've always believed from the start we should have, we, and I'm going to say the industry now, uh, I'll wear my hat as, as chairman of the newspaper industry in 2001, 2002. Just when digital was taking off, we should have made more investments with some of these startups. You know, had we been smart enough to say to Google, you know what, we really like your model and what you're doing. Let us be a minor business partner or, you know, Microsoft. You just go right down the line, all of these startups that were looking, you know, and we kind of said, ah, nah, nah, you know, they're not going to make it. Or it's not going to have much We're impact. We're the newspaper on industry. We, that's right. We've been here a long time. We've <laughs> we've we've survived everything. We've survived radio. We've survived television, and uh, we'll be fine. Well, oops. <laughs> so yeah, it was making those early investments that could have really changed the trajectory of of the industry because we had the money, I and mean, that's the other thing. It's not like we didn't have the money. You know, most newspapers were operating with 20 to 35 percent mar margins. So that was not the issue. It was not having that foresight. And then the other critical mistake I believe we made was not charging for our digital products from the beginning. You know, it's hard to give somebody something free and then come back later on and go, oh, yeah, well, now I want to charge you. Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, had we started out, even I'm old enough to remember uh, when cable television started. And when cable television started, we used to run ads in our paper saying, you can get a $5 a month subscription to the paper or you want to pay $6 a month for cable. 
you know, and so we were the better deal, right? <laughs> yeah. And now what do people pay for cable a month? Pick a number, right? Yeah. 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 A month, yeah. you know. Uh, but had we started out just with a small price, people would have paid, you know, and then you you grow the business. But that's where we made, to me, one of the real, really strategic mistakes with digital. I'd love to dig in a little bit on the AI side of things and what has going on with the New York Times and those lawsuits and all of that. I mean, just thinking about the future of the industry in that regard. Well, yeah, that is, uh, we'll, we'll have to sit and watch. Yeah. Because it's just like any technology, if you use it properly, it works. And when you misuse it, look out, right? And there are also so many unintended consequences that you get with new technology. And let's be honest, they're going, there are people who are using AI for the wrong reasons, you know. But that's the world in which we live. Well, and these, yeah, I mean, Chad GBT and all of that mining, the work that's been done for essentially free, um, not paying the journalists who are doing it and then turning it around and, and building generative content out of it is. That, uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I think you're right. It's going to be fascinating to well, watch. Well, go back, go back just, you know, 15 years ago when, when the other uh, big flat platforms were just picking up our content and putting it on their on, sites, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, and so we've been cherry picked, and uh, but we have no one to blame but ourselves. I mean, let's 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 be honest here. We we had an opportunity to protect ourselves, and we didn't. Uh, obviously, I sympathize with you, but you do make the good point of like uh, the the business of the newspaper is tough now. But there was a time where we, if we had we had the resources to make the right decisions at a, at a certain point. Um, setting aside industry things. In your personal experience, whether it's at the News and Observer or somewhere else, um, can you remember a time you had to make a challenging decision? I guess, my guess would be, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you would say, I mostly stayed out of, I never told the editor what to put on the front page or what not to put on the front page. But there's probably a time when an editor came to you and said, hey, uh, what do you think about this? Can you remember a time where you had to make sort of a challenging either content yeah. or newspaper well, specific decision? Yeah, there, there are a couple that come to mind here in Raleigh. And of course, you know, I've, I was a publisher for we can focus on almost Raleigh. 30 years. Let's talk about Raleigh. <laughs> uh, one that comes to mind, of course, we all remember was the Duke lacrosse. Early on, there was a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion, a lot of just stuff that really didn't make a lot of sense. But it was Duke. It was race. It was sex. It was, you know, everything that people want to read and see about. And, and we had to make uh, a decision on how, how do we play this up, you know? You know, you don't want to be too far ahead of your skis because if you get it wrong, you look pretty bad. And, uh, you know, our editors, my editor, we, we talk about it. And I said, well, you know, just follow, follow how you've been trained and always get two sources, you know, to confirm anything that's out there. And unfortunately, we were getting misinformation from people whom uh, we thought knew what the hell was going on. And so early on, there were a lot of mistakes made, if you will. But uh, I liked the way our folks bounced back and, and started, you know, getting more information to get that story right. Because that was a big story. And there were a lot of lives impacted by that. The other big one that my editor came to me and at that time, it was uh, Melanie Schultz. She said, I just want to make you aware that we've been working on this series, uh, and it's called the 1898 Riots. I said, the 1898 Riots? You've got my attention now. <laughs> what are we talking about? Yeah. And, of course, we're talking about the Wilmington Riots. And she said, uh, it's probably going to make some people uncomfortable. I said, well, those kind of stories always do. I said, as long as we tell the truth. I said, there are, including myself, a lot of people here who never knew about the 1898 riots. And so we have an obligation, if we can do it and do it right, to go ahead and publish, publish you know, the series. And it was uh, very powerful, as, as you know. Uh, a lot of changes happened because of it. 
the one series that we did uh, that I'm really most, probably most proud of, uh, you all may not recall Time of Death. And that was a story that was written in 2001 or 2002, I can't recall, about a young man who was on death row and had been on death row for seven or eight years, uh, convicted of uh, a murder. And our investigative reporter dug deep, deep, deep and found so many mistakes that were made, including the fact that at the time of death, the young man was not even in the state. Whoa. Okay. And we were, through, through that effort, we were able to, for the first time, and I think in the only time, the governor ordered a retrial. And a young man was, you know, uh, proven innocent and released. And that should have won every darn award out there, except for it was up against all of the coverage from 9-11. Yeah. And uh, so I was just, and if you read that series, it was like reading something James Patterson wrote or somebody. It was just, just a, you know, you couldn't wait till the next day to see what was going on. There was just bad police work, bad work on everybody's part to get this young guy convicted uh, when, in fact, he wasn't even in the state. It's the kind the of content that. that would be now, a good podcast now. Oh, it'd be wonderful. Yeah. Just yeah. need someone to dig it up and read it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really good. Time of death. And so you obviously care a lot about journalism and local journalism. In the time since you've retired, you have been a founding partner of or a board member of the Journalism Funding Project. Can you tell us a little bit about what that organization is, why it started? Sure. Uh uh, journalism Funding Partners was Sorry. actually an outgrowth from something we started here in Raleigh. Uh, when we knew, as I said earlier, that the industry was in deep trouble, <laughs> uh, we knew we had to come up with a new business model. And we had heard about uh, some papers uh, around the country who were getting uh, private donations uh, to help with their news coverage. And I thought that was a very intriguing idea. And so I reached out to our CEO at the time and I said, look, uh, we've got a lot of really strong supporters of our work here. And we'd like to set up a private entity, if you will, uh, to go out and solicit funds to help our journalism work. And he thought about it and he said, you know, it's really a really great idea, except we're a public company and uh, trying to set up a nonprofit probably just it's not going to, you know, something we could do. He said, however, if you guys want to try something in Raleigh, go ahead. And so we did that. We hired a, a, a fundraiser by the name of Tanya Taylor to go out and solicit organizations to help us. We were really trying to do better coverage with health and education. And we were able to get, uh, I believe, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Duke Energy, uh, someone else who sponsored content. They had no uh, input on the content, but they wanted to make sure that content was getting to readers. And so that that kind of started the idea, if you will. We knew that you could raise money. And so lo and behold, uh, in the summer of 2019, I get a call from uh, someone saying, hey, remember that idea you guys had in Raleigh about starting a nonprofit? I said, yeah. He said, well, how would you like to do that? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we've got some seed money, and we think your idea is something that could could really happen. And McClatchy at that time gave us $5,000 seed money, gave us uh, use of an attorney to help us set up the 5013C, and off we went. And uh, from that, fast forward, here we are now in 2024, uh, we've been able to put almost 50 reporters uh, in newsrooms all over the country. We're, we're a nationwide organization. And uh, one of our reporters actually was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team. Last year, for the first time, we have two First Amendment reporters 
reporting on the First Amendment, one in Tennessee, one in Florida. Why Tennessee? Why Florida? Well, every year the Freedom Forum does a national survey on the state of the First Amendment, people's opinion of the First Amendment. And in that 2021 survey, two states came out with the lowest opinion of the First Amendment. Now, this will blow your mind. Two states, Tennessee and Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay, think about that. Yeah. One red, one blue. And think about one says the freedom, the, the First Amendment has too many freedoms. The other one says doesn't have enough. And so we, we said to ourselves, wow, wouldn't it be great to educate readers, remind them why we have a First Amendment? And so working with the, first, with the Freedom Forum, they said that's a great idea, and they gave funding to put reporter in Tennessee. We couldn't do Hawaii because like, of the time difference, <laughs> but Tennessee. And then with all of the craziness going on in Florida— we said they need a First Amendment reporter. And again, First, uh, the Freedom Forum said, yeah. And so we've got these two reporters, and they are just doing great work. And people don't think about the First Amendment until it affects their lives. And uh, you guys, every time I give a speech in front of an audience, I, I pull out a $20 bill, and I say I'll give $20 to the first person not using their phone who can tell me what are the five guarantees of the First Amendment? And I've yet to... We don't need to answer that right now. What? I have, I have we can yet, do it. I don't think can't we? I have yeah. yet to give out my $20. All right. Speech, Speech, religion. religion. Press. Press. Assembly. Assembly. That's a good one. Um, freedom, religion, press, assembly. Still got my $20. Ah! <laughs> Petition. Petition. Okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Yeah. It's not Do, embarrassing. It's, I'm pretty you, you good at the rest of the amendments. You, you don't <laughs> think about it until it you need them, you know? And, and so when you remind people why there is the First Amendment and why our democracy works because of it, right, then people, they, they start connecting the dots. Because if you take, take away any of those amendments, then our democracy doesn't work. It's, it wasn't built that way. Well, that's why our forefathers were smart enough to say, you know, we have to put guarantees in here if we're going to protect this young nation. Uh, so, but anyway, I got my $20. It's safe. I like it. <laughs> Is funding jobs the main way that you guys uh, support journalism at the... Um... Yeah, the way, the way it works, uh, I'll give you a good example. There's an organization called One Earth, and they're really really into educating the public on the environment and what's going on with the environment, especially in the Southeast. And through their support and others who have joined in with them, we have put 15 climate reporters throughout the Southeast, not just in newspapers, but television, uh, digital. I mentioned the First, First Amendment reporters. We also have in Miami a funded religious reporter position, and, and listen to this. The funding was by a Jewish and Muslim communities to fund, to talk about religion in their communities. Yeah. So uh, we're doing that. Uh, next up, we want to do more training for these journalists. Ideally, we would have a First Amendment reporter in every state. Right, because their content is free. I mean, wherever it is, it's open to the public. And that's one of the commitments we get with our funders that if you fund this, you can't you you can't tell us what to cover, but we will make sure that that content is available to anyone. And they really, really like that. And so it's wonderful that you have this incredible support. You're able to fund this stuff. It's on the one hand kind of a shame that it even has to be funded this way. But the, where I'm going with this question is libraries are publicly funded. Journalism is often treated, for example, like a commercial purchase. It's just like a, not a commodity, but it's 
it's, it's a public good. We know that when there is not local journalism, it has negative implications on the tax base, on cities, there's no watchdogs, et cetera. Is, should journalism be publicly funded? I mean, I realize there's some boundaries you would want to put around that, but should there be taxpayer funding that drives local journalism? Uh, Ashley, that's a really good question. And if the parameters are set up properly, if the guidelines, the guardrails are put in place that protect the integrity of the content and that uh, there is no oversight other than a good editor then why not? Yeah. I mean, you know, why not? Uh, but again, you, you really have to have everything in place to make sure that the public is getting uh, factual information. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to do. It just it always strikes me as something that has such an obvious community benefit that really should have some more reliable funding source than subscriptions, ad revenue, and philanthropic donations. Yeah, there, okay. there are several uh, newspapers now who are led by nonprofits, and, and they're, they're doing fine. Uh, the, the problem, again, it goes back to those guidelines and restrictions, is when you're getting public money, there's always politics involved. Right. And that's, that's the sticky wicket that mm -hmm. no one has figured out yet. Is, is that any different than, you know, I, I, especially right now, I think a lot of us are cynical about a lot of things. If you told me Blue Cross has philanthropically supported your your journalistic endeavor, even if I have a great respect for you and I know you're involved in it, there's part of me that's going to say, eh, we're not going to get the full story on on that new- the Health insurance um, or the fast med yeah, or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, we, they're not going to touch that one, or, or they're at least not going to go deep on it, right? You know, like, is that any different than what it would be if it was publicly funded? Well, let me let me give you an example. Uh, with let's Blue Cross, Duke, any of those folks, if throughout the year, if we don't write a story that upsets them, then, then something's wrong, gotcha. okay? But with uh, public support monies in Russia, that's how they get their newsprint, right. okay? They right. get their newsprint from the government. And guess what? When you write a bad story, guess what? You don't get your newsprint, you know, right. or you pay a penalty. So that, that's, the, that's the danger. Sure. It all sounds good until some politician doesn't like what you write, and then they try and, you know, sabotage whatever. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's more of a thought yeah. exercise than yeah. I think something that may actually happen. But it does feel like the long-term security of local journalism is going to need more reliable funding than the current model. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We've had uh, billionaires step up and, uh, you know, come to the rescue for, uh, to a couple of uh, news organizations. And for the most part, they've done well. But at the end of the day, you have to have content that people want, people are willing to pay for. And if you do that and, and give them enough of it, then you should figure out a business model that works. The old model is gone. I mean, the, those days are gone. So you have to use technology, but you've got to figure out, okay, what does my business model look like? What can I produce that, you know, gives me a fair profit uh, and and you're not doing this to make money, right? And that's, it was it was a great business for a long time. And then the hedge funds and everybody thought, oh, we can make a lot of money. Well, no, you know, they got in, they got in too late. I love that in that portion of the conversation, you use the the general we a lot. You still have a lot of ownership over <laughs> journal, over the, 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 the space. That's great. Speaking of which, how do you consume news these days? Do you, uh, do you still read a newspaper or two every morning, or no? You, my, I, I sadly have to admit, uh, I all of my reading is done digital, mm -hmm. uh, simply because I travel a lot, and so getting the paper stopped and started was just becoming a real problem for them and also me. But uh, every morning I'm online, going to four or five different news organizations throughout the day. There's, there's a lot of content out there. Do, not even daily. Is there anything else you do regularly? Do you do podcasts? Do you watch news on, on TV? I, I'm not a big TV watcher of news. Uh, late, 
late in the afternoons, I'll watch some cable news before the sports folks come on. I'm really into sports. And uh, in my uh, spare time, if you will, I do a lot of cycling. And that's kind of my hobby. I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, and then I read a lot. I try and read, you know, two books a month. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know where you find spare time because you are involved in a million boards. You have been, <laughs> I, and I wrote this in the question when we sent it to you, I think it's probably easier to list the organizations you've not been involved in in the 24 years you've been in Raleigh. But given that perspective that you have and kind of shifting to talk about Raleigh a little bit, what do you think are the biggest challenges Raleigh's facing right now? Well, it's not just Raleigh. It's uh, growth and having good growth as opposed to having rampant growth with no guardrails. Uh, but I'll tell you this, I'd rather be in a town or city that's growing than the one that isn't. Uh, I don't care where you are, homelessness is an issue in America for a whole bunch of reasons. And uh, I, I like to know that Raleigh has taken that issue very seriously and trying to do whatever they can, you know, to minimize that issue. But that is a that is an issue everywhere. Um, and one that, uh, you know, I cited January of 2000, and people asked me, what do you think about Raleigh? I said, well, we need light rail. You know, why don't we have light rail? We got all these people driving to the park, driving to the airport. Where's the light rail? We still haven't done it. We've talked so about we it. Started. Still haven't done it. Probably you know? missed the boat on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to Charlotte, you know, and their light rail system, and it's doing very well, and they could have doubled the capacity. But people are going to continue to move here, right? And not just Raleigh, Wendell, Nightdale, Apex. You know, we go right down Wake County. Why? Because we have a great school system. We have a great quality of life. Uh as I complain about light rail, we still have systems that get you from one place to the other, uh, and of course the airport. So, uh, but with that, you know, with that comes some pain, you know. And uh, downtown is having their challenges, uh, but I, I like to say that we're going through the peaks and valleys of that, and we're in the coming out of the valley of downtown. Things will get better. People will start coming back down here. Dick's Park will have a tremendous impact yep. on downtown and people coming downtown. And if we can get our uh, gondola put in, what the yes. heck? You know? <laughs> this, this podcast is pro gondola. Yeah, I think Nancy um, mentioned it on like episode two or I three love it. or something. I love it. I, I liked the, the, who was it? Uh, the LMR, the people that own Carolina Ale House and a few other places. They just bought the building downtown. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the things he said was like, I'm not I'm not buying this because I'm expecting it to do great next year. Like I'm buying this because right. this is a long-term vision yeah. and we're a city where people are coming and yeah. we should think that way, not, yeah. oh my gosh, well, well, what's going to happen in the next well, three months? Think of, you know, I mentioned Dick's Park, but also downtown South, you know, it, it's all here. And if we could just remind people of what it was like 20 years ago, and then we had a really nice ride and now, you know, but that's, that's life in general. I mean, yep. that's the ups and downs of, you know, and you plan accordingly and uh, keep putting in the infrastructure, which is very important. You know, it goes back to that whole light rail thing. But uh, we're in a great shape. I, I had someone tell me years ago, if you're not growing, you're dying. Yep. So. And that makes sense. Yeah. What is it about Dick's Park that has you so excited and so interested in being involved in that? Oh, it. I, I, the, the list is too long. But let me just say, it's a for me personally, and for most of our board, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? You don't get to build a destination park, which is literally a mile from your core downtown in America. You know, we're we're it. We're the last city to be able to do that, and we've got a great master plan. Uh, we've got a board that's truly committed, and when it's all done. And, you know, it's a 20-year plan. The people here will forever be thankful of the folks who believe in this park way back when, you know, the 
uh, the Greg Pools and the Jim Goodmans and all of those folks who saw, and of course, Nancy uh, McFarland, who saw the opportunity that we have to, to build this great destination park. And uh, people are, well, what is a destination park? And, and my best answer is it's like going to Disneyland without having to buy a ticket. I like that. I like that a lot. That the Play Plaza should open here pretty soon. It's going to open next year. Yeah, it's going to be know, incredible. We and and I should mention we have our first big major public art uh, project coming in April of okay. this year, right after Dreamville. Put a plug in for Dreamville there. Uh, <laughs> Go but ahead this, and get your tickets while you can. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah, they'll they'll sell it again. But this major art will draw people from all over the region to come and take photos and see this. We're really excited about that, and then. Uh, the sunflowers that are going to go on Lake Wheeler Road, you know, that they'll be iconic. Uh, to my knowledge, there are only two other places in the United States that have art on their power poles. Yeah, Hayes may not know what you're talking about. I, I, the transmission poles I, turning into sunflowers? It's, okay, I saw one pole. I was there this weekend, <laughs> yeah. and I asked my wife, I was like, is that a Feather or a sun, there, there was just a pedal. one it's pole a pedal. with one thing coming off. <laughs> no, it's no, it's not. They're not up yet. They'll okay. they'll be up be in September That's on Lake Wheeler Road. There, okay, there are four I, power poles. Okay, what you have seen is like a prototype, like a miniature version, and the gotcha. by the Next flower to the cottage. cottage. Yes. Yeah, and so these will be replacing the two transmission towers that are on I Lake you, Wheeler. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I go there. I mean, when the dog parks open, I go there almost every yeah. day. They will replicate uh, sunflowers. Yeah, and they're really cool. I was going to say there are only two other places that there are art on power poles that we are aware of. The National Football League, Hall of Fame, and Disney. Huh. So we'll be the third place in the United States that will have art on their power poles. That's pretty so, cool. Good yeah. company to be in. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to oh, chat with thank us today. You. Thanks for all you have done over the last 24 years for this community, oh. and you continue to do. We are very lucky that you decided that the News and Observer was your destination job. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Podcast Raleigh. Review us on your favorite podcast app. If you like this episode, share it with a friend. 